Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Verónica Ibarra y soy directora ejecutiva de SUME Sustentabilidad para México. SUME es el Green Building Council de México y somos un espacio plural que congrega a todos los sectores de la sociedad interesados y comprometidos con el futuro de nuestro país. El día de hoy nos acompañan la maestra Alicia Silva, presidenta de SUME, y Rebeca Ortiz, líder de desarrollo de negocios de GBCI en México, para presentar el día de hoy el caso GRESS, Bienes Raíces y SG. Las mejores prácticas a nivel portafolio. Agradecemos a Rebeca Ortiz la oportunidad de poder transmitir en conjunto esta sesión. Estamos seguros que este espacio será de gran interés para ustedes. Cedo la palabra a Rebe, que nos compartirá la semblanza de nuestros queridos ponentes del día de hoy. Rebe, adelante. Muchas gracias, Vero. Muy agradecida por la oportunidad. Eh, muchas gracias a Sume por un nuevo, nuevo año de colaboración en el que esperamos seguir trabajando hacia el fortalecimiento de la comunidad de construcción sustentable, el avance del LID, el incremento de la experiencia técnica en nuestra región y por supuesto la transforma transformación hacia un mercado verde, resiliente y próspero. Y bueno, pues para el primer episodio del LID Innovators de este año, Gresby, los bienes raíces, el ESG y las mejores prácticas a nivel portafolio, Hemos querido invitar a Gresby, el mayor proveedor de datos de desempeño ESG para inversionistas y organizaciones, y a Verdani, firma de líder de consultoría con más de 25 años de experiencia en sustentabilidad ESG para bienes raíces. Y antes de darles la palabra a nuestros ponentes, eh, quiero platicarles sobre el trabajo que el USGBC y el GBCI hemos desarrollado para el abordaje del ESG y la construcción sustentable. Pues saben, el mercado de la construcción sustentable está evolucionando con compromisos generalizados con la descarbonización y los principios de las mejores prácticas ambientales, sociales a través del cumplimiento de objetivos SG. Aumentando entre los inversionistas institucionales, las empresas inmobiliarias y los fondos de inversión. Y esta práctica incluye nuevos objetivos. para las emisiones de gases de efecto énfasis en temas como la equidad social y la justicia social. Además, a las empresas, los fondos de inversión y los activos individuales se les pide cada vez más que demuestren que sus aspiraciones y planes han dado lugar a un desempeño real y medible. Eh, el mercado inmobiliario global ya es consciente de que las métricas ESG son claves para el desempeño y las inversiones sustentables. De hecho, se espera que la inversión sustentable se convierta en una práctica estándar para la inversión. Eh, y para lograr la transformación global de la agenda ESG, los inversionistas inmobiliarios deben asegurarse de que la gestión de fondos está alineada con el impacto del ESG. Y en esa transformación, el sector inmobiliario es crucial, porque como ustedes saben, los edificios y la construcción representan al menos el 31% de las emisiones de CO2 relacionadas con energía a nivel mundial. Un papel esencial para ayudar a lograr el Acuerdo de París y los ODS de la ONU. Ahora bien, los instrumentos de deuda sostenible en la industria inmobiliaria están vinculados a edificios de bajas emisiones o cero emisiones de carbono y quiero ser muy enfática en esto. El crecimiento de este mercado va a depender de la confianza entre los inversionistas de que los edificios estén haciendo una contribución genuina a la transición hacia una economía verde. Y bueno, por su parte, el USGBC eh, gran, eh, pues gran parte de la base para las finanzas sostenibles está dentro del trabajo que hemos invertido en el desarrollo del sistema de certificación LEED y la infraestructura de herramientas y recursos que hemos puesto en torno a LEED a lo largo de todos estos años. Todo eh, esto ha convertido a LEED en un punto de referencia en el mercado para desarrolladores, instituciones financieras y gobiernos a nivel federal y estatal. Nos hemos enfocado con LEED en nueva construcción desde 1994 a partir de 2007 en LID para edificios existentes, con lo cual hemos buscado abordar oportunidades para la construcción sustentable en dos mercados muy diferentes, el de diseño y construcción y el de ciclo de vida y mantenimiento de los edificios. Hemos buscado asociaciones y relaciones con las principales instituciones financieras que han utilizado LID para sus propios portafolios y a medida que el mercado de la construcción sustentable se ha hecho más sofisticado, hemos podido asegurarnos de que las instituciones financieras tengan una mayor conciencia y comprensión de qué esperar de un activo o inversión verde. Hemos también conversado con los fideicomisos de inversión inmobiliaria, mejor conocidos como Fibras en México, y su asociación tanto en Estados Unidos como en, nuestro, en nuestra región, 
eh, para hablar de cómo pasar hacia la escala de portafolio, para entender cómo un activo verde verificado puede afectar la combinación de inversiones y comenzar a trazar el camino para participar en bonos verdes, préstamos de instituciones financieras y cómo sus inversionistas institucionales están e evaluando la oportunidad de inversión. Hemos también trabajado con Gresby, que muchos de ustedes no saben, pero nosotros somos dueños de Gresby en algún momento, y esto nos ayudó, eh, bueno, como ustedes saben, primero, la actividad de Presby se centra en, los, en organizaciones, o sea, entidades y los fondos de inversión en su conjunto. Lo que pues para nosotros nos ha ayudado mucho a impulsar la conversación sobre sustentabilidad de edificios individuales a portafolios completos. Y finalmente, hemos invertido en la creación de desarrollo de una plataforma que mide el desempeño de los edificios que se llama ARC. Y esta herramienta proporciona un punto de entrada gratuito para los proyectos que buscan comparar el desempeño con el de sus pares, tener un camino incremental hacia la certificación LEED y transparentar este desempeño. También es una forma importante en que los usuarios de LEED pueden demostrar que los ahorros proyectados en el diseño del edificio se han logrado durante la fase de operaciones y además es una herramienta clave para el desarrollo de los reportes de cumplimiento necesarios para ESG. Y bueno, ahorita estamos en la desarrollando la próxima versión de LEED que, eh, eh, que, como ustedes saben, está actualmente en desarrollo y que tiene como objetivo elevar el nivel para el desempeño del edificio, mientras que también estamos tratando de hacer que el LEED sea más accesible para los portafolios existentes. Sabemos que la certificación LEED es una métrica importante para los programas de bonos verdes, como para los préstamos vinculados a la sustentabilidad, así como para los informes ESG, por lo que nuestra versión 5 busca impulsar grandes portafolios puntos de entrada para el mercado, pero también busca empujar a los líderes del mercado para lograr lead platino y lead cero, para elevar el nivel de compromiso, proveyéndoles de herramientas más eficientes para hacer más fácil este camino. Y bueno, eh, mientras eh, eh, tendremos, tenemos las presentaciones, yo en el chat les voy a compartir algunos recursos que como organización hemos desarrollado, que justamente buscan facilitar el abordaje de, y el cumplimiento del ESG. Y bueno, ahora sí, para entrar en materia, quiero presentar a nuestros ponentes en orden de aparición. Comienzo con Robert Sloco, que es director para Gresby eh, eh, para las Américas. Eh, Robert se desempeña como ESG and Climate Director en Gresby. Previo a Gresby, Robert dedicó ocho años como miembro senior en MSCI ESG, impulsando el crecimiento del negocio de ESG en activos públicos en Estados Unidos. La experiencia de Robert se ha enfocado primordialmente en inversiones, incluyendo investigación de mercados emergentes y trading, global custody, FX e investigación económica. Su carrera abarca territorios en Europa y en América, colaborando en diferentes roles senior en compañías como Thomson Reuters, Galleon o RBC, entre otras. Robert posee un Master of Arts en Economía por la Universidad de Economía de Cracovia. Además, cuenta con un MBA en Finanzas por la Universidad de Fort Ham en Nueva York. Adicionalmente, Robert es un CAA, CAIA eh, Charter Holder. Y también tenemos el gusto de presentarles a Emma Huizar Félix. Emma es experta en sustentabilidad. Actualmente se, se desempeña como Associate ESG Manager para Verdani Partners, donde supervisa los programas ESG para portafolios internacionales para diferentes clientes en los sectores industrial, comercial y residencial. Anteriormente, Emma fue subdirectora del Departamento de Operaciones y Desarrollo de la Comisión de Energía del Estado de Baja California, donde se enfocó en la estrategia y reposicionamiento de la entidad y ha fungido como especialista senior en sustentabilidad en Alliance Residential, donde fue responsable del programa de sustentabilidad de la compañía que abarca más de 150 mil unidades eh, este, en los Estados Unidos. Además, formó parte de la Iniciativa de México Economía Limpia 2050, organizada por la Universidad de Stanford, seleccionada para pa participar en el Waste Management Innovation Forum, enfocada en la problemática de los residuos a nivel nacional en Estados Unidos, y ha sido voluntaria en varias organizaciones lucrativas con impacto en la juventud eh, vía Leader Foundation, AES Ivy League Project, Kidwind México y Mi Mundo. Emma cuenta con una maestría en gestión energética del I. ESCP Europe Business School y una doble titulación de la Universidad Estatal de Arizona en Desarrollo Sostenible con especialización en Energía, Materiales y Tecnológica y a estudios de diseño con especialización en Arquitectura Paisajista y con varias capacitaciones, entre las cuales resalto el Programa de Eficiencia Energética en Economía en Economías Emergentes, C4, de la Agencia Internacional de Energía, IEA, Tax Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures para el sector financiero y ha participado en la Cumbre de Líderes del Pacto Mundial de las Naciones Unidas. Eh, les recuerdo, por favor, que pueden utilizar el chat para hacer sus preguntas. Ya al final serán facilitadas 
en, en la sesión de preguntas y respuestas por Alicia. Alicia, muy agradecidos por tenerte el día de hoy y por ayudarnos a facilitar esta conversación. Y sin claro más, sí. te cedo la palabra, Alicia. Pues muchas gracias y muy agradecidos tanto para Robert como Emma. Y bueno, tenemos el privilegio también de que Emma es mexicana trabajando en Estados Unidos y que nos va a poder dar la parte primera de, de la exposición en español. Y Robert, aunque habla súper bien en español, eh, nos va a dar su, su, su sesión en inglés para que se sienta más cómodo. De todas maneras, cualquier cosa que ustedes necesiten, en el chat lo van poniendo y vamos respondiendo. Y de verdad, para nosotros es muy importante como sume estar poniendo estos temas enfrente, porque consideramos que ESG es algo que se oía muy poco hace unos años y sin embargo cada vez está cobrando más relevancia y necesitamos herramientas y especialistas. Y bueno, SUME con el GBCI, pues lo que están haciendo es traerles a los especialistas a nivel mundial que nos puedan ayudar a desarrollar bien este mercado. Así que muchísimas gracias y creo que el primero que empieza es Robert. Muchas gracias. Uh, voy a, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Partir mi, mi presentación. Aquí. ¿Pueden ver mi presentación? No. Sí la estábamos viendo, Robert. Ahora, muy bien. Sí. Sí, adelante. Muy bien. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, gracias por invitarme. Uh, Alicia, Rebeca, Vero, uh, gracias a ustedes uh, por estar aquí. Uh, mi nombre es Robert Sloco. Uh, soy responsable por um, GRESP en uh, Estados Unidos, por oeste de Estados Unidos, oeste de Canadá y América Latina, toda la América Latina, incluyendo México. Eh, pero vamos a cambiar el idioma, porque es mucho más fácil para mí hablar y describir cosas de sostenibilidad eh, en, en inglés. Entonces, cambiamos el, el idioma. Uh, so what is GRASP, really? I'm here to tell you a little bit about, you know, like, what's, what's that initiative? how it started, what's it all about, what the benefits are potentially, you know, for the participants. And uh, if you don't get everything, you know, from this presentation, don't worry about it. You can always connect with me and I'll be happy to, you know, like give you a little bit more color, you know, like on a one-on-one -on -one kind of, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one presentation. GRESP is an investor-led initiative. This is something that is, has to be understood. And perhaps some of you right now hear from your investors that you should be a little bit more transparent in terms of sustainability in your own funds, portfolios. Uh, and to do that, you should do GRASP. Uh, so investors actually had this initiative. They wanted more transparency. They wanted more visibility in terms of ESG risks in their funds and portfolios, real estate funds and portfolios. And they mandated the research on creating a uniform, consistent mechanism to measure those ESG risks and then monitor them over time and to give a tool to those managers to be able to Um, manage those risks. If you don't measure, it's very hard to manage anything. So uh, we are we basically created. You know, it actually was created by academia. You know, the 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 GRASP uh, um, framework or a questionnaire, um, and we do it in a very consistent manner. You know, across the board, and we've done it over a long period of time. So there's pl there's plenty of definitions of GRASP. And there's, you know, like always, you know, something to learn from each. But I would like to uh, make sure that you're going to understand that GRASP is the largest, the most comprehensive ESG assessment and benchmark that is targeted, tailored for real estate that exists on this planet. And if you're a real estate 
manager, uh, you know, if you have a portfolio, you, if you have a fund, this is the angle that we're looking at. That's what you should care about. One other thing that has to be noted is that those investors, when they had this initiative about the transparency of ESG risks, this was about non-financial, sort of extra financial, you can say, uh, data that would help them understand what material risk there are outside of the financial data. Material in a sense that if they were ever to come to fruition, there would be value destruction of those funds and portfolios. So this is the angle that GRASP kind of has been put together. GRASP has been around for 13 years right now. We started in 2009. And if you think about 2009, it's ancient history for ESG. At the time, there were very few people that knew what ESG was, and there were actually very few visionaries of you know, ESG at the time, you know, like those risks that are beyond, you know, what I can find in the financial statement that exist and that I should know about them and I should have some kind of a mechanism to kind of, you know, monitor them over time. There were quite a few phases of development of GRASP and, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it, but, you know, we've seen an incredible growth, an incredible adoption in terms of, you know, GRASP, you know, across the board. It's going to be more about that. So other way to kind of, you know, like uh, tell you what GRASP is, is, you know, you can see this triangle. There are those portfolio managers. There are the operators of real estate that could be property managers. It could be developers. And GRASP is the way for them, a uniform, consistent mechanism to understand the ESG exposures. They, they provide this information to GRASP. We, as an intermediary, as, you know, as this entity that sits in the middle, as an objective party, the most recognized party in that respect, provide them with a report. And they can use this report for internal purposes to basically improve uh, the ESG standing, the ESG exposures. They can also share it with the investors. And probably some of you may be right now hearing from your investors that they would like you to you know, present a little bit more about you know, your ESG risk exposures. So that's the mechanism. And on the left hand side, you have a snapshot of, you know, how this report looks like, you know, like a few pages there. GRASP is also an ecosystem. Uh, think about GRASP as being, you know, the circle in the middle, this glue that sort of like connects all the stakeholders that are, you know, part of this ecosystem. That ecosystem you know, like, uh, for the sake of this presentation, I've broken down into this, those quadrants. So you have this four, you know, slots, you know, like uh, that, that represent different types of stakeholders. Let's start from the investment um, investors, sorry. Um, so that, uh, so that uh, quadrant, which is in the top left-hand corner, 250 of them. There are 250 formal, investor members in GRASP, meaning these are the investors that have ingrained ESG considerations in the capital allocation decisions, and they are formally associated with GRASP to help uh, for that mechanism to help them allocate capital accordingly. And if you are a fund manager, that should kind of give you a good idea, you know, like that that's the positive attention that you want to attract, you know, these guys, because they sit on a large pool of capital. And there's, in fact, more investors that care about GRASP and they take it into consideration in the investment capital allocations, but they are not formal investor members of GRASP yet. We're working on it. Hopefully there's going to be more and there's always more every year. If we go down to this number 1,820, this number represents the number of funds and portfolios globally that are part of GRASP as of 2020, 2022, sorry. Uh, so this is, this is the number of those, think about them as, you know, these are those funds and portfolios. These are those information providers. These are, these are these guys that, you know, have to run through this questionnaire 
and provide all the best answers to receive the report and either use it internally or communicate it to the investors to attract the positive attention. Then if we move to this bottom right hand corner, there's 115 uh, partners. We have a robust partnership program. Partners you can think of as consultants. These are the firms that help those to be uh, GRASP participants to become GRASP participants because they may not know how to handle this, how to start it. And they also help those existing uh, GRASP participants to improve the standing. And the great representation of that um, group uh, of those of of this of these partners is my uh, my you know fellow speaker Emma who's going to be speaking after me she she represents Verdani Verdani is a global partner one of the uh, largest partners those organizations you know they are in this partner program they are essentially sort of like GRASP certified they are competent in this what they do they can really help you know those. Uh, those fund managers to get into GRASP. And then if we move up, this number 38 uh, represents the uh, real estate associations. So think about them as you know, various types of thought leaders that want they have a vested interest in GRASP. They are operating in real estate and they want to uh, have a good kind of, you know, they want to be uh, you know, steering GRASP in the right direction because they want you know, the real estate to move you know, in that sustainability direction. And a good representation, good example of them would be GBC, which is you know, the equivalent of that in Mexico is SUMA or GBCI, right? Um, so there are like you know, a bunch of those organizations that you know, like they are thought leaders. So let's move on. This represents this, uh, this slide represents those investors, right? Those investor members. And this is just an example. Obviously, this is not the entire list. There's 250 of them, roughly. Um, some of them you probably know very well. Some of those names are massive. These are some big pension plans. We know not only have pension plans there, we also have foundations, endowments, asset managers that allocate to real estate. So there's you know, a huge pool of capital that those organizations sit on. And you know, it's roughly 22 trillions in English uh, USD that they sit on. I'm not saying that this is all dedicated to real estate, but a portion, a sliver of that is, and it's really worthwhile to attract the positive attention. This slide represents the names of those, some of the names of those fund managers that report to GRASP. And as I mentioned before, we have 1,820 of them represented as of 2022. And they manage between 150 to 200,000 assets or 150 to 200,000 buildings globally as of 2022. So some of those, those names probably are also very familiar. By the way, all this information is available on our website. You can just, you know, like go on our website and you're going to be, to be able to see that there are sections about it. So um, GRESB is a global benchmark. Uh, we've seen an incredible growth and incredible adoption. Uh, this uh, top left hand chart, you know, this bar chart shows you, you know, like, you know, over time, how the benchmark has grown. You know, one thing is an assessment, right? Like it's for the individual fund, but, you know, as this assessment becomes part of, you know, like of, you know, the report comes out and so on, then, you know, it becomes, you know, like part of the benchmark. So there's loads of aggregate data that GRASP sits on. Um, as of 2022, 1,820 participants. This year, 2023, Keep in mind that GRASP is an annual sort of assessment. We, are, we run on an annual cycle. We probably going to cross 2000. Um, if, you, if we move to the right, further to the right, you can see this horizontal uh, bar chart and you can see all these different sectors. So all these different sectors are being represented, some more, some less for different reasons, but all the real estate sectors are being represented in GRASP. There's no exceptions. And then on the, on the you know, furthest right, you have an example of man, uh, names of the managers and the number of funds that they report to GRASP as of 2022. Um, 
And then I just wanted to show you a little bit, you know, like how we stack up regionally. So that, you know, bottom graph represents uh, different regions, how they fare versus each other. Um, so how does Europe do versus the Americas and Asia and et cetera. Uh, and you can see that most probably, you know, like for all of us, the most interesting line is the red one that represents Americas. So we lag in behind Europe, which is not a surprise because the initiative started off in Europe and Europe is the most advanced in respect to adoption. But at the same time, I want to tell you that the global growth of, of GRESP over the last three years was about 20%. Last year in the Americas, we grew over 30%. And given that, you know, there's such a spike in interest in the Americas and also such a deep capital markets here, perhaps, hopefully, uh, you know, at some point, this red line is going to cross the blue line. Uh, so, so that's... That's essentially, you know, like how we look, how we look, you know, like on the regional basis. Now, I want to make sure that, you know, that we understand, we, we all understand that GRESB is a journey. It's sort of like, you know, embarking on a uh, healthy lifestyle kind of regimen, right? You can always drop out, but why would you? I mean, like, you know, like it just doesn't make sense. And also, you know, if you've been pressurized by the investors to uh, have, you know, more, I mean, to basically have more transparency in terms of ESG risks, to measure them, to manage them, and to monitor them over time, it's in your best interest to do that. Um, so one thing to know for sure is that when you start doing GRESP, you're not going to shine. You're not going to be a superstar. It never happened and probably is not going to happen. Rome wasn't built in a day and it takes time. It's the same, you know, like, I don't know, what comes to mind is, you know, you may be a talented athlete, but it's very hard to win a gold medal just, you know, just by joining the Olympics or something. It's, it's a lot of training needed and so on to kind of uh, still, you know, win something. Uh, so don't expect that you're going to do well, super well, you know, in, in year one. At the same time, if you do grasp in year one, and you're not going to do well, you're sending a very strong signal to your investor base. You're basically communicating to them that you are committed, dedicated, and serious about ESG or sustainability, however you want to call it. And they appreciate it. Why? Because GRASP is not easy. It's the most comprehensive, the most thorough ESG risk assessment for real estate. And they appreciate it. They recognize, you know, like this, as a standard and doing it is not easy. So you don't have to be a superstar. Over time, however, you will be better. You will improve. And these lines that I'm showing you right now represent groups of funds that joined GRESP in different years. And as you can see, all of them, you know, move to the top right-hand side. And at some point they converge there um, and create some kind of a leading pack but it takes years to do that because it's an annual cycle. And why does it happen? And why, for example, you know, early, in early days, you know, in the first years, you know, this growth is very steep and then it's sort of like flattens and plateaus because in the first year, you are exposed to a massive education. You just suck in, you know, all this education and you also, you know, formulate policies. You formulate sometimes procedures that never existed in your, in your firm. You learn how to collect the data. You learn how to organize. You learn how to, you know, run that process. And after the first year, potentially, you already have, you know, so, sort of like your library of things, you know, like that are needed for GRASP. Uh, and in some cases, you know, some of those policies or procedures, they don't change and they are even in our system. So you only focus on the missing parts. So in fact, what we're doing, we're providing you with a gap analysis. GRASP is sort of like a, find, you know, like with, it's a mechanism to find the, find the needles in the haystack and to provide you, you know, with this, you know, understanding of the gaps that you have that you should take care, take care of. And some of them you're going to plug, you know, in the first year. And some of them you have to plug in the following year, but you're going to learn about them in the first year. So anyways, you're going to grow. 
you're going to grow pretty steeply in terms of you know like your performance your standing within grasp and then one other kind of observation from this study is that the sooner you start the faster you go into be in the leadership pack where your investors expect you to be at some point um and i guess you know like another last observation that i at least have from this analysis is that if you start one year ahead of your peers or competition judging by this analysis it's going to be probably two to three years for them to catch up to you and obviously you've got you got an upper hand you know like versus your peers and competition in terms of positive visibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh the investors if this is what you care about so uh that's the analysis that i'm that i wanted to share with you um in terms of uh, grasp you know like i think you know like grasp is a very thorough granular sort of uh measurement mechanism with very rigorous about it so you can compare it sort of like to in a way to this iso standard uh we're going to ask you know all kinds of questions sort of like this 360 kind of assessment um and in terms of the flow of data and information uh the big difference between you know let's say certificates such as you know the one that um Rebe, you know like mentioned uh lead for example uh versus grasp you know they are being done on an asset level so on a building level what we care about you know at grasp is the portfolio level is the fund level um and in some cases we're going to collect the data from the building asset level but we're going to aggregate it into the fund level so think about you know probably on the governance side we're going to be asking questions around you know the aspects on the fund level on the portfolio level in some social aspects as well in terms of environmental probably quite a lot of data that is going to be flowing from the asset building level uh, and it's going to be aggregated one one other note about it is that let's say if you have a portfolio of 10 assets and you only have data on five that's fine i mean you don't have all the data then you probably you know you need more time to collect the data over the years uh to have access to that uh but what we ask you to do is to report on all 10 buildings but you're only going to have data on five and um, and in terms of you know again flow of information you know we produce this report that report is owned by you know the fund manager and then the fund manager can share it doesn't have to but can share it in its entirety in pieces and bits with the investors with other stakeholders that are interested in seeing you know their standing in respect to esg and uh, one other uh, thought is that we do not discriminate whether it's a list whether it's a public company or it's a private company in fact in our benchmark 80 percent of the companies are private majority of real estate is in the private hands so 80 percent out of this 1820 participants they represent private assets this is re really my last slide and you know like those of you that actually come to the esg space and are puzzled sometimes maybe they are you are dizzy of all these different acronyms you know that float around and you don't know what to do with them and you know like which one i should start with and why should i do it in the first place and and so on um there are different frameworks there are different associations there are different you know regulatory frameworks uh there are different organizations and they all have acronyms uh, in esg that's how it is uh one thing that i want you to know is that if you do grez uh, in real estate you take care pretty much of you know all your headaches you know with all other acronyms uh so for example the sasb and gri they are also esg frameworks but these are more you know frameworks all encompassing sort of like more generic frameworks across different sectors and industries and they indicate you know like which risks should be considered you know in different sectors and industries grasp has been in the first place you know like created dedicated to esg in real estate so 
the bar in terms of what you have to do to do GRASP is much higher versus SASB or GRI. If you do GRASP, you're going to do very well uh, you know, in SASB or GRI. There may be some little bits and pieces that you have to add, but very little. But like, it doesn't happen the other way. Um, and all these other frameworks, uh, regulatory, you know, like requirements, associations, organizations, and so on. If you do GRASP, you're a real estate manager, that's good enough. It's, it's the best what you can do. Plus, you know, the investors ask about GRASP and not the other kind of frameworks. So with this, I'm just going to kind of pause because, uh, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you also with too much information. You can always connect with me and I'm happy to kind of share more. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, like it's the best to kind of answer them, you know, we can, we can answer them, you know, there's going to be a Q&A session after that. But, you know, if you have any questions that you would like to ask me just, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you can always reach out to me. This is my contact information. And with this, I'd like to say, I should have said, muchas gracias. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to uh, pass it on to Emma. I think she has some kind of interesting poll for you. And Emma, representing Verdani, she's going to tell you a little bit more about her angle you know, of a consultant, of a partner organization of GRASP and how they sort of help the other players, you know, like in this ecosystem, this GRASP ecosystem. So, and I'll stick around for any questions. So thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Robert, y gracias, Emma, por estar aquí. Eh, nos da muchísimo gusto que nos expliquen GRASP. Eh, sabemos que es algo emergente. Afortunadamente, muchas eh, fibras están empezando a trabajar con GRESP, otras ya llevamos varios años trabajando con GRESP y con los resultados. Y por supuesto, que esa fue una de las razones por las que invitamos a Verdani, porque está trabajando con Pigeon Real Estate y está llevando eh, pues, la parte de los reportes junto con eh, los equipos de México eh, para poder hacer estos reportes. Emma, nos da muchísimo gusto tenerte aquí y que nos platiques de cómo ha sido su experiencia, sus retos y todo lo que han visto en, este en esta explosión de ESG. Y, y ustedes son pues, de los que más hacen GRESP, ¿no? ¿Cuáles son estos retos que han tenido? Así que muy bienvenida y gracias por estar con SUME y con el GBCI en Lead Innovators. Muchísimas gracias Alicia y gracias Robert también por la explicación y, y muy agradecida por la oportunidad este, de compartir aquí un poquito de, de lo que hacemos en, en Verdani y, y dar un, un, un pasito más a, a cómo podemos empezar y, y aclarar un poquito el panorama ¿no? de que, que yo creo que el mundo ¿no? de ASG puede ser un poquito complejo. Eh, de entender, entonces eh, pues esperemos que les guste la presentación y voy a poner un poll yo, eh, la, mi presentación también le va a ser en inglés es lo que habíamos eh, más o menos acordado pero cualquier pregunta o lo que sea, pues también se vale en español, puedo hacer el cambio también eh, pero voy a poner un poll para pues destacar un poquito ahí a la gente <ríe> eh, creo que no tenemos la habilidad de Hacer, la, hacer las preguntas en, en ahorita en Zoom. Entonces se los pongo ahí y si pueden responder por el chat. Eh, la primera pregunta es si su empresa, si ustedes saben si su empresa o compañía eh, reporta o está interesada en reportar ingresos o en algún otro, eh, otro estándar. Y la segunda pregunta, si su empresa ha, ah, pues, se ha acercado hacia una firma de consultoría especializada para, en, en ASG ¿sí? para poder incorporar todas estas iniciativas. Pues les vamos a pedir que vayan contestando en el chat. Justamente. <risa> Gracias. Les <risa> damos unos minutitos antes de que... De que hagamos la transición. Sí. Y ojalá les esté pareciendo interesante la, la temática porque sí, sí es importante empezar a, a, pues a comunicar un poco más eh, todo este mundo que ya, pues que ahorita se está viendo como un boom, pero ya lleva varios años este, en movimiento. ¿no? Entonces, 
está la audiencia un poco tímida, les invitamos a, a, a contribuir un poquito. Pasa, pasa. También se vale, no sé, si no saben, pues no pasa nada. Okay. Si sí, no, la primera vez que escuchan de Gress. Te voy a empezar a platicar sobre los resultados, Emma, para que ya este, podamos seguir adelante. Dice, ah, bueno. Tú nos dices, sí, está interesada y aún no ha tenido ningún acercamiento. Después César nos dice, sí, ambos. Eh, después nos dicen que, eh, que no y, y este, que sí tienen ya un servicio de consultoría. Después eh, 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 nos dicen también eh, que sí solo trabajamos con LID, pero no. Ahorita vas a explicar un poquito más de eso. Eh, eh, y bueno, aquí hay alguien más que, lleva, eh, que ya lleva varios años este, eh, eh, reportando este, y otro que dice no, pero eh, we're not in the real estate sector, we do renewable energy project development and then yes y, uh, y bueno, otro que, que dice sí, tres años eh, etcétera, creo que que, este, que, 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 que algunos, algunos sí, algunos sí, algunos no entonces no, no, es está está bien. Bueno, pues, eh, I'm going to switch to English so we can start the presentation. Um, and what we're going to be reviewing, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of like the industry trends, um, the ESG reporting frameworks that we looked at from the consulting uh, uh, perspective and what are some of the best practices as well. Um, so a little bit on company highlights and what Verdani does um, more in ESG consulting firm overall. Um, so Verdani is, like Rebecca mentioned uh, earlier, is a leading full service consulting firm with team members with over 25 years of experience in sustainability and ESG for real estate. Um, since 2013, we've been supporting our clients um, to empower them, empowering these organizations with cost effective strategies to create sustainability and resilient building communities. So currently we are supporting ESG efforts for 21 national and international real estate firms with over, this accounts over 5,600 properties managed across uh, 1.3 billion square feet of diversified real estate portfolios. And these represent um, approximately $660 billion in assets under management and administration. All this is across North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. So a little bit unlike other sustainability or ESG consulting firms, um, Verdani tries to make it more uh, to view all these sustainability challenges from the owner's perspective. Um, so our approach with the organizations is to plan and execute um, the ESG strategy that is measured and improved on a continual basis. Um, our clients uh, do have like ongoing programs uh, that we go through the whole process with them um, from beginning to end um, on an annual basis. And this allows them to have access to the knowledge and expertise of, of a, like over 80 person firm on ESG professionals. Um, some of the clients that we represent are here in this slide and then um, a couple of stats that we looked into. Res is very important. The building certifications as well, like LEED is important. We have Energy Star certifications as well. Um, and as well, uh, our annual ESG reports are always GRI aligned. And I'll go through how do we fit each of these standards and frameworks um, into the whole program in a little bit. Um, so a little bit of industry trends. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities uh, that have arisen within the ESG environment reporting world, um, but the most uh, topics, like the most hot topics that are right now are climate related risk and decarbonization. 
um, where investors are putting a lot of uh, importance or weight to, to their assets on. So a lot of the initiatives have to be aligned to decarbonize the life cycle of their supply chains or the life cycle of the assets, et cetera. Um, as mentioned, as Robert was mentioning in his presentation, he talked a lot about the investors. So the investors are the drivers that are going to be um, kind of pushing a little bit more on how to implement these ESG uh, strategies as well. We have climate resilience and adaptation. I think we're all feeling a little bit um, the climate change in our different regions wherever we're at. Um, there's a lot of uh, also biodiversity risks and a lot of that this is a high uh, trending topic as well. Um, and all these, not just environmental, but it goes as well with social issues uh, in the supply chain as well. And putting a little bit of an example with Mexico scenario um, and overall in the overall market of, of Mexico and specifically in the private and the public uh, market, uh, any kind of activity that is going to happen, it will be inside a building. Um, so if we take into account that Mexico has a high um, importance or in, in the industry sector, uh, these occur within a building. And if we take a look at the six states across, the, across Mexico, which is the north part, um, that have over 30 years with investment that are heavily in the, in the industrial sector. Um, and, this, and let's put on aside the activity itself, but the fact that at the end of the day, all this is happening within a building and there are operations that are, that are happening within, uh, that are impacting um, the environment, the social uh, as well, the social sector and the governance. Um, it is extremely important that the supply chains and the life cycles of the buildings have it, like put into account ESG measures. Um, and if we want to take it a little bit further, um, there's a lot of like the governments that are talking about nearshoring or even the private sector taking advantage of the nearshoring uh, topic or conversation. Um, this ties to ESG as well. Um, so there's a lot of global organizations that are looking for ESG characteristics at some point of their process. Um, any investment that is going to have, it's going to start pushing a little bit more on how we're going to be uh, taking a, a step further into implementing these ESG strategies. Um, so it needs to be embedded not just in the assets and the building itself, but as well as the business model and how we are running um, the business itself. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit on the frameworks of ESG. So here we find four categories. Um, we have the standards and guidance that are at organization level, and they provide recommended methodologies and guidance as how organizations might identify and manage and report on sustainability performance. Um, we have voluntary disclosures. Uh, these are applied at portfolio level, like Robert mentioned, REVs is here. Uh, and these provide, these assess the ESG performance through the implementation of policies, practices, um, and require the performance data information. And this typically take a form of, uh, of questionnaires and are used for evaluation and ranking. So if you do disclose to any of these um, frameworks that are in this particular category, you're gonna be able to rank yourself with your peers. Um, and this is why grass within the real estate um, market is so important for investors. Um, we have the thir involuntary third party, uh, which is for public traded companies or capital market at capital ma market level. Um, and these assess the performance based on aggregated and publicly available data, including company source uh, feelings or public data, such as like websites, the annual reports and or, or the ESG annual reports as well. And then we have the fourth category of net zero initiatives um, that these are correct organization level as well. And they provide industry guidelines developed to standardize corporate net zero targets and assess this targets contributions to the global net zero goals. So here um, we can see some of the 
initiatives or like um, the commitments that governments do or uh, the companies itself are doing in terms of decarbonization. And this is the most recently, um, they've gained more attention given to this global concern on climate change. And the investment industry is at tipping point with 43 trillion funds to commit to net zero. So um, this is data from Willis and Towers Watson. So it's a total of 236 investors that are not part of a net zero asset managers in initiative. So this is a, a very trending category um, that I think we're going to be seeing a little bit more uh, um, of attention that is going to be brought up to. And we have two other categories that I did not include in this one because they're more at the asset or like the, like the asset level, which is like the, the building level certifications. Um, like Rebecca was mentioning, like LEED, um, there's WELL, there's BRAM, there's FitBell, DGMB, ASHRAE, BOMA 360, Energy Star, IRM, and all these occur at a building level. Um, so if your building is part of a portfolio or an organization, having that this certification is, is only going to help um, the organization or the portfolio to report to any of these um, other categories or frameworks that are going to be within these categories. Um, another important aspect to take into account are the regulatory disclosures. And these also occur at organization level. And these are more, um, these are mandatory. Um, this is kind of like what, there, it depends on the region or the location of the asset. So let's say you have an international portfolio, um, you're probably gonna have to disclose to different regulatory frameworks given that your assets are in different um, uh, geographical locations. So for example, in the US, we have benchmarking laws, the SEC, ESG disclosure. In Europe, we have SFDR, we have the EU taxonomy, we have MEPS, CSDD. Um, and I took a little bit um, on the next slide, um, uh, I took a little bit on talking a little bit more on the existing policies and regulations in Mexico um, that are around the construction uh, market and the new development and anything that has in relation to the real estate um, area. This is just a list because they're, to explain, they're, they're quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of uh, different norms and regulations in Mexico. So if you're not familiarized with them, I really encourage you to take a look at them and and try to see which ones you qualify. And for this, I did not include the ISOs, which are, those are like globally as well adopted, but Mexico does use a lot of ISOs within the projects, especially for like solar or any renewable um, energy projects. So the first one is on energy efficiency, the energy conservation code in buildings. Um, it does like uh, design, it, it, it addresses design and operations and it's voluntary. We have the norm, the norms, a, let's, Noms and names. Um, they explain the requirements of like residential and non-residential building um, and at the envelope um, because a lot of the attention within this past, like the past slide, the regulatory frameworks are putting a lot of attention on the materials. What materials are you using? How are you building? Um, is this being like, are you putting a little bit of um, the environmental product declaration? Are you having the materials have EPDs or they don't? Um, so some of these no, uh, norms do address those kind of requirements. Um, we have also on thermal insulation um, and this kind of has a little bit of attachment to energy efficiency as well. And the last three are a little bit more focused on the EPDs um, and the, envi like the environmental product declarations and the engineering works. What are the basic rules? Um, building commissioning and BIMs as well. So there are a number of norms and regulations that do address these and can help you out. If you are following these, can help you out on uh, when you want to report to, to any of these uh, other frameworks, such as Gratis. Um, so how do investors use the ESG rating? So how am I going to use my results from Gratis if I'm submitting there? Um, so there's calls from investors to improve the data quality and standardizations that have begun to shift the industry towards a system of consolidation and regulated reporting. Um, 
And this is uh, part of what Robert was mentioning. So we do assess the risks and opportunity because that's what they want to, they want to know how their investment is performing. Um, did I do, did I did a good investment or not? That's the bottom line, right? Um, so they do want to have a compare, a comparison of measuring apples to apples because none of the assets are the same. Um, and the frameworks, they help them. They help them see if they have, um, they have identified non-financial factors that are impacting the company's financial or the investment financial or the operating performance of, of it. Um, so taking a little bit on focus, uh, focusing a little bit more uh, in detail on grads, these are the results of our clients and the funds that we uh, report to grads in 2022. We had four submissions that rank uh, first in management and performance. Um, this was Howard Hughes Corporation and PGM Real Estate. We had other uh, four submissions that rank first in management and development. And I think um, putting a, a, giving a little bit of explanation when we say management and performance, REST is divided um, in like three sections. So you have the management, which anybody, um, everybody has to report to. And then we have the performance and development as well. Um, so let's say that you are a developer um, and you don't uh, operate your building, then you will report on management and development. But if you have assets uh, that you do operate, then you will report on management and performance as well. So we do have a lot of like sector leaders um, designations such as Howard Hughes and PGM as well that they are performing very well and this is reflected in their uh, rest results. So going a little bit into best practices in implementing an ESG strategy, what, what can we do? How can we start? Um, the first thing that um, we need to identify, so these are some of them um, that sometimes clients just come and like, oh, I'm interested in this, or I'm interested in that. And we have to take a step back. We help them on taking a step back and putting like, okay, what can we identify? Are you identifying any mandatory benchmarking on audit ordinances? That's kind of like a priority number one. Do you have a data management process in place, any utility automation? Um, uh, I implement green leases. Are you implementing green leases? Um, you, are you, do you have already some, goals and targets um, that are related to ESGs um, are any of like, do you have a budget specifically for energy efficiency projects? That's also important. Um, if you, you have to like, who are your main drivers? You have to be able to identify your stakeholders as well. Um, and normally with, uh, on our annual kind of like what Robert was saying that res is, is, is cyclical, um, the, ESG programs are also cycle. You have to assess them. Um, and that's why you have your annual um, ESG reports. And within the within those reports, you're reporting your progress. You're, you're, you're stating um, and communicating. And at the same time, you're educating your stakeholders on how well you're doing and if you're performing well or not. Um, and this also takes into account the ESG budgets because that's also a priority. You have to be able um, in order to to implement this best practice, you have to have the budget to do so. Um, and, and that also puts into, into account like the financial um, analysis and incentives and rebates that sometimes they're out there. There's a lot of rebates and a lot of good programs in Mexico um, that you are able to leverage from. There's Ecocasa, there's Programa Si, FIPATEM, they've been there I think since the 90s or even before, um, but do take leverage of those. Um, I, I deeply encourage them. And so one of the first steps that we do um, is identifying ESG priorities. And we take them, we take our clients into this process of having a visioning survey. What is important for that company? Because they're all different. Having the materiality survey and then we come up with program priorities and that's how we start setting goals and targets into that. 
And then once we have all that, then we can, then we're able to develop like a 10 year ESG strategy, which is what we, what Verdani recommends. Um, not necessarily has to be a 10 year strategy because that will depend on the, on the, like the status of the client. If, if it's a new client, if you already had something um, going on, how fast they want to move. Um, there's a lot of different factors that are going to uh, impact this strategy or setting like the number, but this is kind of like what we uh, normally recommend and covering the environmental, the social and the governance aspects as well. And how, what, how do we know if we're meeting these targets or not? Well, we have the environmental performance indicators. Um, these are just one of them. There's also social indicators. There's also like the governance indicators that are also tied on. And there's a lot of like cross um, reference between the indicators, um, but this help us um, measure and, and see how we're, how we're making progress. So we have like the um, energy use intensity, uh, we have um, the water use intensity as well. We have even um, waste diversion. How are you doing? Are you implementing anything? And then we measure them. How are you performing? Because we set up a baseline on it. So some of the benefits for Mexico. Two minutes. Oh, sorry. Some of yeah. the benefits for Mexico is that we're reporting to frameworks um, like RAS can provide many benefits for real estate companies in, in the country. Um, so we have increased your competitive advantage. Um, and, and normally the real estate companies in Mexico may not be aware of the importance of sustainability reporting and the benefits of participating in, in GRASP. So this is very helpful, but this will help you gain more competitive advantage. And then also the adaptability for, for PMIS, right? Smaller real estate companies um, may lack the resources to collect and report the necessary data. Um, but nevertheless, you are not, that does not limit you to incorporate any ESG strategies. Um, according to INEGI, there's like 99.8 of businesses in Mexico are PIMIS. And going a little bit back to my first slide, um, all activities happen within a building. Um, so small and medium companies, these, that's what PIMIS means. Um, so companies that generate 78% of employee, of employment um, are, are females. Um, the data availability um, could be a challenge, um, but some of the data may not be readily available in Mexico, but um, there, you, have, you have to leverage the, the driver of the investor, like the, the investor is driving you for this. So leverage it into getting that data so that you're able to report um, on any of the regulations and also leveraging the regulatory framework that it's already existent there. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for staying here. Gracias a todos. Estamos viendo algunas preguntas en el chat. Y pues muchas felicidades, Chile, siempre apoyando porque eh, GRESP eh, funciona para eh, portafolios de, de edificios, de real estate y también para infraestructura. Entonces, eh, estamos viendo eh, preguntas como eh, si, eh, are, eh, ¿cuáles son todas las certificaciones que se aceptan en GRESP, Robert? Eh, esa es una, una de las preguntas que nos están haciendo en el chat. Y eh, si eh, ESG puede ayudar en el due diligence, Emma, si esa ha sido tu experiencia. Entonces, Robert, eh, ¿cuáles son todas las certificaciones que, que acepta Gres? I cannot just list them out out of, you know, of the top of my head because there's so many uh, that we accept that we, uh, you know, that are approved for GRASP. Just keep in mind that, you know, uh, asset levels certification is an important aspect of asset assessment, but there's some others that you have to also take into consideration. And if you're interested, what uh, certificates actually are approved to, you know, like by GRASP as, you know, as something that is valid, you know, I can provide you with, you know, like guideline kind of document, and there's going to be the whole list, very long list, uh, you know, of, of various uh, certifications. I would also note, you know, like, because, you know, I guess, you know, this other question is more directed to Emma, but, you know, in terms of due diligence uh, for a uh, new development and in the context of renewable energy, well, uh, if you're thinking about, you know, like building an asset, which is going to be part of your portfolio, that you're going to then report to GRASP, then you also have to think about 
energy efficiency right and energy efficiency you know like the, you know like how you're going to you know how this asset is going to perform is super important in terms of you know this you know e element environmental element you know in the context of your reporting to grasp that's what you know the investors are caring about more so because of the changes you know seismic changes that we are right now you know experiencing uh you know the climate kind of focus is big so you know and renewable energy is, is sort of like an answer uh to you know to the climate challenges that we have so uh there's more and more aspects of you know of climate related you know risk mitigation in uh, assessment so uh, Emma, uh, Emma yeah. do you think due yeah. diligence is this a list that will help yes. you with your due diligence yes just like robert just to add to to robert's comment it is part of the strategy due, due diligence is part of esg strategy and and particularly for new developments um it does help in the way that you are making sure that those ESG initiatives are going to be implemented and followed up in the future uh, of the project. So, so it's crucial to, to incorporate them. And then um, one more question. How big or small does your fund have to be to apply for GRASP? Um, and do you encourage small funds to start analyzing how they're doing in GRASP? And this is for Robert and then for Emma, like what are the challenges of the small uh, portfolios or small investment funds in terms of like performing well? Go ahead, Robert. Well, well, uh, there's no restrictions in terms of, you know, like the size of the portfolio. In fact, you know, majority, uh, you know, of, uh, of the portfolios that are being reported to GRASP fall in the category of the small funds uh there's not so many of those big funds in in the first place um and you know how do you define a portfolio uh well it can be even one asset but you have to start somewhere right um so you can start from one asset if this is what it is you know your portfolio and then if, if you, you know, acquire or develop more assets then you know obviously you know like they become bigger but to you know there's no uh restrictions challenges uh you know it could be resources right like you know like but we all deal with resources so it's like there are issues related to you know la large portfolios and how do you handle large portfolios which with many assets uh you know this may be large firms okay fine but do they know what they're doing do they have you know uh, teams that are you know trained that do they have you know like ability to kind of you know collect all the data organize it you know like they have all the policies procedures in place you know like i don't know stakeholder engagement you know like for the most part they don't right like so they have their own challenges so everybody has the challenges in terms of you know getting on that path and it really takes uh, energy time commitment work and so on thank you robert emma um i think one of the challenges is with the data uh gathering the data that's uh one that comes up uh constantly um but there's also a lot of new technology that it's happening that like it's occurring and it's coming up so so we try to leverage that and and guide the client into what's the best way to to approach it um in terms of the size uh on what to report on res or any other uh framework i think we have clients that have funds that report to grass but have like 10 assets probably at minimum um there's also some that have even more um uh, like double or more uh, but nevertheless it's like what robert said if you have that one asset you can make it extremely uh like sustainable you can make it net zero or carbon neutral um and and that's always like the goal right if you start somewhere then then i think it's 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 good to have that initiative in place eh, solamente eh, preguntaban sobre sobre un sobre archi gresby eh, les estoy poniendo mm -hmm. en el chat un documento que eh, de alguna manera explica a grosso modo cómo ARC este, ayuda justamente con el reporteo este, y, y, uh, y bueno, en, en cada indicador de Gresby para que ustedes lo puedan revisar. Este documento se actualiza cada año eh, por, uh, por el equipo de ARC Score. Yo espero que ya eh, 
ya que ahora está comenzando ya el reporteo de, 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 de Gresby, tendremos este, este reporte ya eh, actualizado probablemente para la próxima semana. Así que les pido buscar en las redes que, que tendremos este recurso ya este, eh, eh, disponible para todos ustedes. Y yo quiero agradecerle a todos que estamos usando más de su tiempo porque quedamos de 5 a 6, pero esto era muy importante. Creemos que México y toda América Latina puede eh, beneficiarse de todas estas herramientas que están saliendo y cómo en sinergia se pueden ir trabajando. Así que quiero agradecerle muchísimo a Rebeca, a Robert, a Emma, a, a toda la gente de SUME y a todos los participantes que nos apoyen Vamos a estar recibiendo todavía preguntas, si algunos de ustedes tiene. Y bueno, ya dejo que Vero eh, nos dé eh, el cierre del de webinar. Muchas gracias, Alicia. Muchas gracias a los ponentes, Rede. Les recordamos que Sume comparte webinars, cursos, talleres y otros eventos todas las semanas. Los invitamos a seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales para que puedan enterarse de nuestra oferta académica y de nuestras actividades para que se sumen a SUME. Muchas gracias a todos y que tengan una maravillosa tarde. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Buen día. Bye. Buen día.